okay, the story is, God wakes up one day, and that's assuming that God gets tired and sleeps. So he gets up one day and says, I'm just lonely. I'm, I just hang out with myself. I want to see my own reflection. Why do you write? You want to see your emotions on paper. Why do you talk to someone? You want to see the reflection of your own intellect, your own history on another faces, other faces, you know. Uh, you watch a movie, let's say The English Patient. It's a reflection on the love you once experienced many, many years ago when you were five years old. It's all about seeing your own reflection coming out of loneliness. Why do you read? You read because you don't want to feel alone. Everything that we do, we do so because we don't want to feel abandoned, isolated, lonely, depressed. And the assumption is God felt all those emotions. And so he tried to create something magical, something majestic. And of all the creative things, it was only the human being who was able to reflect back to God, perfection. Now, it's a great story. Whether or not you want to believe, that's a different, you know, different thing to deal with. As stories go, it's a great, great story. You know, it talks about how desperate we are to see our own reflection, how desperate we are to experience perfection, to be inspired, that even God at times feels lonely. So just in case you feel lonely, you don't need Prozac, you don't need to drink, you don't need to smoke, just go out there and find friendships. Friendships in whom you can see your own reflection. But the question is, what sort of reflection of yourself do you want to see? Do you want to see yourself, your reflection as a drunk, as someone intellectual, someone who's a thinker, feeler? Does that, Harvey? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cannibalism. I'm so sorry you have to take that class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it, that, that topic makes me think of morals and how morals uh, can change based on your situation. Um, listening to it and talking on EG yesterday and getting very different ideas about the source of human morals or, or Western morals. No. You know, the problem with Western thinkers, um, whether it's Socrates or Plato or Sartre or Nietzsche, is that they're not grounded people. You know, grounded in the sense that, you know, none of the modern Western philosophers, and they're mostly men, none of them were married. David Hume wasn't married. Nietzsche wasn't married. Um, Sartre, well, he, was a, he wasn't married, but you know, he had animals. Um, and so what you have when you're not grounded is a set of ideas that are abstract. You know, for those of us who live a very grounded life, we are responsible for our parents, job, mortgage, children, family. I need a philosophy that works for me, where I am. You know, I don't want to attach myself to Nietzsche, who's got no wife, who's got no kids, who's got no parents, who doesn't have really relationships with anyone. He locks himself in a room and just writes. You know, I, I have a wife. I need to see my reflection in my wife, my kids, you know. And so as bumper stickers go, I think these, these guys offer beautiful set of ideas. The only thing is they themselves were never tested. You know, Kant can come out and say the golden rule is great, never lie, under any circumstance. You know, but you're talking about a guy who is not married, who doesn't have a kid, who doesn't have to steal to feed his children. So his ideas are what? They're nice, they're just useless. They're not part of the human experience. They're part of someone's intellectual experience, and that's great. And if you're not careful, those people can contaminate the way you think about life. And if you're not careful, one day you'll go to your wife and say, I don't think you and I are getting along anymore. And that's the dangerousness of these ideas, you know. So, who was that?
I'm just kidding. Uh, anyone else? <sighs> Wolf. Um, one of the things that was in the video that you watched was about how the mother passes her heart onto children that are losing her and she has to do with this. It's not cannibalism, but in a sense, it's kind of like, could you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> It's all about eating, right? If you look at a human being as a four or five story building, on the bottom floor what you have is their physical body. Okay. And sometimes you just eat their physical body. You know, you're not emotionally connected, you don't really care about the way they think about the world. They have zero soul, so spiritually they're dead, but you enjoy having sex with them. Nothing wrong with that. And sometimes you sit with your family and you break bread, but there is no conversation, there is no emotional connection. You just sit there. It's just nice to be in their physical presence. Okay. Uh, the second floor is where the emotions live. Sometimes you go to a certain person because of the way they feel about things. And that's how you break bread, not physically, but emotionally. But that means you have to have the same emotions inside you, there has to be compatibility, and then you sit, then you put those emotions on the table, and then you break bread like that. Now that can happen organically, uh, and that can be guided. You know, one of the nice things about creating friendships, for example, in such classes, classes as this, is that when you come to class on Mondays and Wednesdays, this is what we talk about. I've been talking about the same goddamn stuff every single time we meet. Everything has been the same, okay? Now, when you create a friendship in this class, it means that however long that friendship lasts, it's just going to be revolve around these ideas and the emotions these ideas create. Now, that is a guided set of emotions that live inside you. And they're guided by me. So I become the creator and the two of you go somewhere and you talk about these ideas and in some ridiculous way I also am present in your gathering. Not physically, but in different ways. On the third floor lives, lives the intellectual part. The things you've thought about, you know. And the funny thing about the intellect is that Intellect branches into different areas. You can be reflective about your physical life. That creates a good set of emotions. Or you could simply reflect on specific emotions that now live inside you. You don't want to talk about your dad, you don't want to talk about your mom, but you want to talk about guilt. It's a very, very intense and profound emotions, but now you talk about it reflectively. Okay. And so when the two of you sit together, you break bread intellectually. And then there is the spiritual part. And that is very complicated because now everything, your body is baptized by the spiritual component, your, spir your emotions are baptized by the spiritual component, and your intellect is baptized by the intellectual component. So everything is seasoned by the spirit. There are moments where there is no longer a need for any expression. You don't want to break bread with anyone except yourself. And you don't even want to do that. Um, I don't want to get into it because it's a little difficult even for me. So the point I'm trying to make is if you were to look at people as three or four or five story you know, houses, then the question is when you enter into someone's presence, do you know exactly what you're walking into? And do you know that if you want your emotions to be visible, to be seen, to be embraced, to be eaten, if this person has the teeth and the digestive system 
to first chew your emotions and then push them down in hopes of processing them. And that's where friendship comes in, you know. Um, for many of us, our friendships really just revolve around two things. Someone gives us pleasure or we can use someone uh, to get somewhere ahead in life, in our physical life. And there is nothing wrong with that, you know. I'm not going to be hurt if someone uses me to get 10 classes. That's okay. okay. There is this other friendship that's very, very tough to find, uh, very tough to protect and to sustain, which is imagine you like the writings and the talks of Angela Davis. Okay. She's about 80 now. You really have to beg her to send you a text, to just look at you. She rather walk her dog, whose name is Seneca, you know, than to sit and talk with you. But once you gain her trust, once there is history, once there is intimacy, then you can sit back. And if she says okay to a friendship with you, keep your mouth closed. Keep your emotions to yourself. You are not interesting. You have a woman who is 80, who is one of the founders of the Black Panthers. She can tell you a thing or two about, you know, the history of certain groups of people. She's been in prison. She's lost her job. And she's 80. She's old. Um, so those kinds of friendships mean that you have to kind of refrain from ever coming out and telling her who and what you are and what you're interested in. She doesn't care. You're simply there as a container to be filled with the contents that live inside Angela Davis. That's a good eating experience. And that's a good friendships to have, friendship to have because she will help you change the way you feel and think about things. And the other thing about this particular friendship is that Imagine, for example, you come to my office and you say, my father hurt me and I want to talk about it. I say, no. Let's talk about betrayal, why it happens, how it happens. Well, you're not betrayed by a dog, you're betrayed by your father. Let's talk about fatherhood. Here's your father, you just didn't come out of the rock. Let's talk about sex. And every time you want to make your story small, I say, no, expand it, make it bigger so you can see the whole picture. And that's a friendship that you would probably need, you know, because as long as you hang around with people who just keep you in your small, tiny, little, pathetic world, you will keep talking about your hurts. But as your world expands and grows bigger, you also gain perspectives, okay? And as you get bigger, the smaller parts of you drops because you no longer see value in those parts. Now, that is a good friendship to have. They're very, very difficult because the person who wants to expand us, make us grow, has to exercise a lot of patience. You know, I don't know if you have animals. I mean, I don't, but from what little I've seen people, you know, uh, it takes some um, days or weeks or months to train your cat or dog to bathroom at a specific location not on the bed, not on your laptop, you know? And uh, that's what it is. You know, you just need to be trained where to poop and what kind of poop is the best poop to have. So, uh, anyone else before we Go home. Andrew. Um, you started talking about the observing on Monday. But I was wondering if the, um, the chills that music can produce in us came up. The, the what? The, the chills uh -huh. of the automatic you know, hair standing up. Yeah. And who gets those and why? Is it purely neurological or is there something else going on? <sighs> I, I, all of us in this class have had moments where we 
either accidentally turn on the, the radio and Michael Jackson is singing like they don't care about us or something. And uh, you kind of go home being somewhat reflective and sad and angry and also paralyzed because you have no idea what to do. You know, his song has burdened you in ways that you didn't predict. And you look at this entire social structure and, you know, it's you're far too small. So you kind of lock yourself in your room, turn off the lights and, I don't know, beat up your dog. Um, I think instead of just talking about music, let's just do it this way. That works for me. I don't know if it'll work for you. I think in life, uh, sometimes accidental, sometimes again guided, that music inspires certain parts of you. How and why that happens, I don't really know. Uh, sometimes it can be someone's voice. It could be music, it could be movies, it could be a book. Who the hell knows? It could be a homeless man sitting by the street. And it's like you have a body experience. So you don't really much care about the tables and chairs of your life. You are connected to something, something mysterious. Uh, that your own skin is a little too small for you to be housed in. About almost 30 years ago, I signed up to go to this monastery above Chico. It's a two hour waiting list, at least that's how it was a long time ago. And there were no cell phones or texting or any of that stuff, so we had to send a postcard in. And so uh, one day, you know, I get a call, I go in, and uh, they wake you up at like three in the morning. And they give you like a hundred sheet of paper. And they say, okay, your task for the next two hours before we eat food which is like a piece of bread and some water, is that you write down the Jesus prayer. And for those of you who may not know, it's Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on my soul. Um, now, why did I want to go to the monastery? Well, just the name monastery. It has roots. It brings up feelings. I'm not sure why or how. It connects me to, I don't know, the Christians. It connects me to... Those who want to live a different kind of a life connects me to Jesus Christ. It connects me to his lifestyle. And just religious tradition, period. That there is something more to life than simply the tables and chairs and the things we pursue on a daily basis. So that in itself creates a psychological impact. And why did I even choose this monastery? Because Abi and I had a friend, David Long. One day in class, he mentioned the name. I went and looked for it, I found it, I submitted an application, and they called me. Okay. Now, I had no idea what I was walking into. So you begin to write. First, they wake you up at three, you know. So first, you kind of are angry. You know, why did I come here in the first place? I want to just go back to sleep and have my dream about Angelina Jolie. And then you begin to write. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. I don't care about all that stuff. But then, you know, you have to keep writing. And at a certain point, I'm not quite sure how it happens, and it doesn't happen all the time, okay? At a certain point, you say, Jesus, a man, Christ, he was touched by something mysterious. How is that even possible? How does one become worthy of being given a phone number by Beyonce? I mean, you have like a million people listening to you sing. And beyond, out of the million people out there, Beyonce looks at you, comes to you, and gives you a number. How does that happen? What is it about you that's so special? No one knows. And then you're kind of uh, emotionally in awe. And intellectually you're paralyzed because there are no answers to it. Then have mercy on me, on my soul. Well... I mean, sure, some people go to the monastery because they got parent issues. Some people go to the monastery because they got no life, you know, and that's the only place they can go to find comfort. They're not really looking for any bigger meaning to life. Um, 
So am I in the monastery for what reason? Is there a soul in me? And the answer is no, not really. I'm looking maybe for one. So like Malcolm X, I become a mystery to myself. And that in itself creates more of an awe. And then sin becomes another element. And it, you know, it takes time for you to get through all these layers to ultimately have these words go inside you and impact you and create the psychological effect. And so you write the whole thing down, you go to the main hall, you have some breakfast, no one's talking to you, no one is looking at you. And it's not something you're used to. You know, I'm used to coming to class and talking, rambling on for hours, and then going home and rambling on, you know. Now, when you go to this particular space, no one looks at you, no one talks to you, no one listens to you, you can't talk to anyone. You feel completely isolated and abandoned. And somehow you have to deal with the whole thing. And then uh, at a certain point, you have to go to the music hall where these monks are standing there and chanting. I mean, Gregorian chant, you know, all these people singing in harmony to one another, and it's amazing. And, you know, different people have different reactions. Some people sit quietly, some people cry, some people have this stupid grin on their face, you know, some people their heads are bowed. Um, and you can have these moments in all sorts of different ways. Uh, they're unknown to us, you know. Uh, they are really kind of like Christos. Somehow you become anointed by something and something about you gets elevated. You become inspired, you become aware, you become mindful. It's not that you understand any of those emotions. All you know is you embody some things. And... Uh, when Auspinsky, Gurdjieff's teacher, uh, when Auspinsky first met Gurdjieff, he wanted to scream. He wanted to laugh. Why, how, who the hell knows? When Irina Tweedy first met her teacher, Bai Sahib, she saluted him. Why, how, no one knows. And the truth is, uh, we don't know if we are open. We don't know how this opening appears. But anything out there could act like a lute or a drum or a guitar or Michael Jackson. Anything out there has the power to inspire us if we happen to be in the right space. I'm not quite sure how that comes about. But the more sensitive you are, the more open you are. And that's the trick. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you've ever like liked someone. If you really, really like someone and you weren't sure if they like you back, you have this urge to call them. And every time you pick up your phone to call them, you begin to shake a little, you begin to doubt yourself a little, you know, you have the fear of rejection. How could an image, how could a phone, how could a phone number that you see with your eyes create all that impact? Because there's a history in it. You may not know, you know, why you like this person, but nevertheless, that experience has the power to create certain openings about you, that everything becomes sensitive when it comes to that particular person. And imagine if you call them, uh, first you prep, okay, I'm going to talk to them about philosophy first, then I'm going to ask them about how their parents are, then if they want to have food with me. And then, you know, she says, hello. And then everything you prepped goes out the window. Uh, Joe? Yeah, that's me. Who the hell is this? This is Jim. Yeah. What do you want? Nothing. Uh, did you lose your keys? No, I have them right here. Okay, see you around. Okay. Then let's just say you like someone, you call them, they say yes to a date. You can't even bring yourself to gaze into their eyes because they'll crush you. You're open. You're open. You're sensitive because you like them. Why? Who the hell knows? Who cares? You know, but music really is one of the shortest ways. As you, if you have a buffet of them, you know, it's good that you enjoy 50 different kinds of music and you're looking for a specific emotion to come upon you. And you're looking for a specific kind of emotion because you've gone through those emotions a few times and you like them and nothing compares to them. So you flip through the radio station, you know, for hours until comes this song. And then you sit back and you relax, you park your car. You know, once you know the sort of emotions you want, you will <coughs> probably 
have maybe one or two genres of music, that's all. And you won't listen to any other. <coughs> and maybe you will, I think Plato was right. Um, you know, when you're a kid, you just kind of have milk for food. When you get a little older, you know, your parents mash some potatoes and carrots for you. When you get a little more mature, you eat steak. You know, and then after a while you can eat anything. <clears throat> I think when you get to a place um, where you're able to process things really, really well, you can eat shit and it'll nourish you. I mean, not literally, but you can take a lot of trash and the trash can teach you a good amount of things. I mean, that's just being very, very proficient, like a professional human being. I'm sorry about this class and all the other classes. Anyone else? Where's you? Noor? Yeah, yeah. Me? I like sad music. Sad. Yeah, I don't like American music. Deep depression? <laughs> uh, yeah, sad music because Persian is a sad culture, and we have poets and artists who write reflectively deep issues about life that make you sad. Uh, they talk about the struggles, the betrayals of life, the fact that we are containers for great things, but we always choose small things. And that's one of the things that when you walk towards your old age and eventually fall victim to sickness and then you die, you always have this deep regret as to how you could have spent so much time being an idiot. You know, it's something that Socrates had talked about before his death, which was, you know, I don't know why human beings have no shame. They have no shame. You know, they attend uh, about 18 hours of their day uh, taking care of their body and a minute towards their soul. And it should be the other way around, you know. Uh, and it's something I think when Jesus went to Greece and learned how to speak Greek, uh, he read dialogues of Plato and he plagiarized, Jesus did, you know. But he gave it to us in his own way. What benefit is there for man to gain the whole world but to lose his own soul? Jesus was a bit more poetic. But, uh, and I think it's a good sadness to have. It doesn't make life easy, it doesn't make friendships easy. But should you be able to create friendships revolving around the right kind of sadness, then most of your interaction with those people are going to have depth and meaning and purpose, you know. And you can break bread. And the nice thing about having those friendships is that you break bread physically, you break bread emotionally, you break bread intellectually, and even spiritually, you know. Uh, we had gatherings for almost 20 years where every other week we played music, uh, we had food, and so we go in, people talk about politics, they talk about religion, that's you know, the gossip for the Persians. And then tea is served, which is great. And we've been together for like 20 years, all these people. We all and, you know, uh, lived in Sacramento for all these years, so we kind of get to know each other. And all of us, you know, one was a dishwasher and now is a city manager, the other was, I don't know, a janitor now is a city manager. So everybody started as being nothing and eventually they became physically something, physically in the middle of financially prosperous. And um, then a family goes through the trouble of making food for like 50 people. Then at a certain point, some guy says, okay, Amir and Kazem and Yadi, I go to their cars and grab your stuff, come in. And we go in, we grab our microphones and instruments and amplifiers and we turn off the lights and we sit and play music for about four or five hours. And what you realize is you have about 30, 40 immigrants who have found friendship in a strange land called America, okay? 
they're very hospitable, they're very respectful, they may not like some of the people in the room, but nevertheless, they say nothing about that. The moment someone enters, everybody stands up. It's not like here, you know, Americans are so weird. You know, you invite people and people are sitting, you know, and someone comes in and no one stands up to greet them. You know, they don't even look at them. They don't even care. Uh, so in our gathering, the moment anyone would come in, everybody would stand up. They would like pause everything until they would go around and shake hands. You know, if they're very cute, you kiss them uh, without their husband noticing. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then uh, you talk politics, you kind of just vent that out. Uh, then you chit chat about the day, you get rid of that pressure. Then you have food and everybody gets in their own tiny little group and talk politics some more. And, and then we help clean up and then we play music. And you realize in a night of five or six hours, you have all different levels of your existence all satisfied. And the next day you just call and say thank you. That's a good friendship to have. Is there a quickie out there? A quickie question? Go ahead. Lewis. What's the most unethical part to eat? Like from somebody. Uh, what? Like if you're going to eat someone, what's the most unethical part to eat? What? Whoa, 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 this is the most important and interesting. <laughs> All right, listen, um, that's a very unethical question. We should take an ethics class. <laughs> I will save that for uh, next life. So uh, have a nice day. Have a nice weekend. Lewis, I didn't know you were that creative. Good for you. All right, you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.